sorry to go back there just to linger on the term because it's so interesting, persuadability. Mm -hmm. Did I understand correctly that you mean that it's kind of synonymous with intelligence? So it's an engineering-centric view of an intelligence system because if it's persuadable, you're more focused on how can I steer the goals of the system, the behaviors of the system, which meaning an intelligence system maybe is a, is a goal-oriented, goal-driven system with agency. And when you call it persuadable, you're thinking more like, okay, here's an intelligence system that I'm interacting with that I would like to get it to accomplish certain things. But fundamentally, they're synonymous or correlated, persuadability and intelligence. They're definitely correlated. So, so let me. I want to. I want to um, preface this with with one thing. W when I say it's an engineering perspective, I don't mean that the standard uh, tools that we use in engineering and this idea of of enforced control and steering is how we should view all of the world. I'm not saying that at all. And and, and I want to be very clear on the because 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 people do email me and say, ah, this engineering thing, you're gonna drain the, you know, the life and the majesty out of these high-end like human conversations. My whole my whole point is not that at all. It's that uh, of course, at the right side of the spectrum, it doesn't look like engineering anymore, right? It looks like it looks like friendship and love and psychoanalysis and all these other tools that we have. But Here's what I want to do. I want to be very specific to my colleagues in regenerative medicine. And just imagine if I, you know, if I if I went to a bioengineering department or a genetics department and I started talking about high level, you know, cognition and psychoanalysis. Right? They didn't want to hear that. So, so I I bring my I focus on the engineering approach because mm -hmm. I I want to say, look. This is not a philosophical problem. This is not a linguistics problem. We are not trying to uh, define terms in different ways to make anybody feel fuzzy. What I'm telling you is, if you want to reach certain capabilities, if you want to reprogram cancer, if you want to regrow new organs, you want to defeat aging, you want to do these specific things, you are leaving too much on the table by making an unwarranted assumption that the low-level tools that we have, so these are the rules of chemistry and the kind of remolecular rewiring, that those are going to be sufficient to get to where you want to go. It's a, it's a it's an assumption only, and it's an unwarranted assumption. And actually, we've done experiments now, so it's so not philosophy, but real experiments, that if you take these other tools, you can, in fact, persuade the system in ways that has never been done before. And 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 we can we can un unpack all of that. But it is it is absolutely um, correlated with intelligence. So let me um, flesh that out a little bit. Um, what I think is scaling in all of these things, right? Because I keep talking about the scaling. So what is it that's scaling? What I think is scaling is something I call the cognitive light cone. And the cognitive light cone is the size of the biggest goal state that you can pursue. This doesn't mean how far do your senses reach. This doesn't mean how far can you affect it. So the James Webb telescope has enormous sensory reach, but that doesn't mean that's, that's the size of its cognitive light cone. The size of the cognitive light cone is the scale of the biggest goal you can actively pursue. But I do think it's a useful concept to enable us to think about very different types of agents of different composition, different provenance, you know, engineered, evolved, hybrid, whatever, all in the same framework. And by the way, the reason I use light cone is that it has this idea from physics that you're putting space and time kind of in the same diagram, which is which which I like here. So if you tell me that all your goals revolve around maximizing the amount of sugar con the amount of sugar in this in this, you know, 10, 20 micron radius of space time, and that you have, you know, 20 minutes memory going back and maybe five minutes predictive capacity going forward, that tiny little cognitive light cone, I'm gonna say probably a bacterium. And if you say to me that, well, I I'm able to care about uh, several hundred yards uh, sort of scale, I could never care about what happens three weeks from now, two towns over. It's just impossible. I'm saying, you might be a dog. And if, and if you say to me, okay, I care about uh, really what happens, you know, the financial markets on earth, uh, you know, l long after I'm dead and this and that, say, you're probably a human. And if you say to me, I care in the linear range. I actively, not, I'm not just saying that I can actively care in the linear range about all the living beings on this planet. I'm going to say, well, you're not a standard human. You must be something else because humans, I don't know, these standard humans today, I don't think can do that. You, you must be some kind of a bodhisattva or some other thing that has these massive cognitive light cones. So I think what's scaling from zero, and I do think it goes all the way down. I think we can talk about um, uh, even, even particles doing something like this. I think what scales is the size of the cognitive light cone. And so now this is an interesting here I'll, I'll try for a definition of life or whatever for whatever it's worth. I spent no time trying to make that stick but if we wanted to. 
Uh, I think we call things alive to the extent that the cognitive light cone of that thing is bigger than that of its parts. So in other words, rocks aren't very exciting because the things it knows how to do are the things that its parts already know how to do, which is follow gradients and, and things like that. But living things are amazing at aligning their, their competent parts so that the collective has a larger cognitive light cone than the parts. I'll give you a very simple example that comes up in, in biology and that comes up in our cancer um, program all the time. Individual cells have little tiny cognitive light cones. They, the, what are their goals? Well, they're trying to manage pH, the metabolic state, uh, some other things. There are some goals in transcriptional space, some goals in uh, f uh, metabolic space, some goals in uh, uh, physiological state space, but, but they, they're generally very tiny goals. One thing evolution did was to provide a kind of cognitive glue, which we can also talk about, that ties them together into a multicellular system. And those systems have grandiose goals. They're making limbs. And, and if you're a salamander limb and you chop it off, they will regrow that limb with the right number of fingers. Then they'll stop when it's done. The goal has been achieved. No individual cell knows what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective absolutely does. And that process of growing that cognitive lycone from a single cell to something much bigger, and of course the failure mode of that process. So cancer, right? When cells disconnect, they physiologically disconnect from the other cells, their cognitive light cone shrinks. The boundary between self and world, which is what the cognitive light cone defines, uh, shrinks. Now they're back to an amoeba. As far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just an external environment. And they do what amoebas do. They go where life is good. They reproduce as much as they can, right? So that that cognitive light cone, that, that, that is the thing that I'm talking about that scales. And so when we're looking for life, I don't think we're looking for specific materials. I don't think we're looking for specific metabolic states. I think we're looking for scales of cognitive light cone. We're looking for alignment of parts towards bigger goals in spaces that the parts could not comprehend. And so cognitive light cone, just to uh, make clear, is about goals that you can actively pursue now. You said linear. Like within reach immediately. No, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't mean that. First of all, the goal necessarily is is often removed in time. So in other words, when you're pursuing a goal, it means that you have a separation between current state and target state at minimum, your, th your thermostat, right? Let's just think about that. There, there's a separation in time because the thing you're trying to make happen so that the temperature goes to a certain level is not true right now. And all your actions are going to be around reducing that error, right? That basic homeostatic loop is all about closing that, that gap. When I met, when I said linear range, this is what I meant. Uh, if I say to you, this, this terrible thing happened to, uh, you know, 10 people and, and, you know, you have some, some degree of activation about it. And then they say, no, 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 actually it was a hundred, you know, 10,000 people you're not a thousand times more activated about it. You're somewhat more activated, but it, but it's not a thousand. And if I say, oh my God, it was actually 10 million people, you're, you're not a million times more activated. You you don't have that capacity in the linear range. You're sort, of, you're sort of, right, if you think about that curve, we sort of, we reach a saturation point. I have some amazing colleagues in the Buddhist community with whom we've written some papers about this. The radius of compassion is like, can you grow your cognitive system to the point that yeah, it really isn't just your family group. It really isn't just the hundred people you know in your in your you know circle. Can you grow your cognitive um, light cone to the point where no, no, we care about the whole, whether it's all of humanity or the whole ecosystem or the whole whatever. Can you actually care about that the exact same way that we now care about a much smaller um, set of people? That's what I mean by linear range. But you said separated by time, like a thermostat. But a bacteria, I mean. <laughs> If you zoom out far enough, a bacteria could be formulated to have a goal state of creating human civilization. Because if you look at the, you know, bacteria mm. has a role to play in the whole history of Earth. Mm. And so you know, if you anthropomorphize the goals of a bacteria enough, I mean, it has a concrete role to play in the history of the evolution yeah. of human civilization. So you, you do need to, in, in, when you define a cognitive light cone, you're looking at directly short-term behavior. Well, no, how do you know what the cognitive light cone of something is? Because yeah. as, my, as, as you've said, it could be, it could be almost anything. 
the key is you have to do experiments. And the way you do experiments is you put barrier, you have to do interventional experiments. You have to put barriers between it and its goal, and you have to ask what happens. And intelligence is the degree of ingenuity that it has in overcoming barriers between it and its goal. Now, if it were to be that, now, now this is, the, this, this is I think, a, a totally doable but, but impractical and very expensive experiment, but you could imagine setting up a, a scenario where the bacteria were blocked from becoming more complex, and you can ask if they would try to find ways around it, or whether it's actually, now nah, their goals are actually metabolic, and as long as the, those goals are met, they're not going to actually get around your barrier. The, 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 this, this, this business of putting barriers between things and their goals is actually extremely powerful, because we've deployed it in all kinds of, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll get to this later, but we've, we've deployed it in all kinds of weird systems that you wouldn't think are goal-driven systems, and what it allows us to do is to get beyond just the 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 what you call the anthropomorphizing claims of say you know saying oh yeah I think you know I think this is thing is trying to do this or that the question is well let's do the experiment and one other thing I want to say about anthropomorphizing is people people say this to me all the time um, I, I I don't think that I exists I think that's kind of like you know uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you why I, I think it's like heresy or like uh, other other terms that uh, aren't really a thing because if you if you unpack it here's here's what anthropomorphism means humans have a certain magic and you're making a category error by attributing that magic somewhere else my point is we have the same magic that everything has we have a couple of interesting things besides the cognitive icon and some other stuff and it isn't that you have to keep the humans separate because there's some bright line it's just it's it's that same old uh, all, all I'm, all I'm arguing for is the scientific method. Really, that's really all this is. All I'm saying is, you can't just make pronouncements such as the humans are this, and let's not uh, sort of push that. You have to do experiments. After you've done your experiments, you can say either I've done it and I found, look at that, that thing actually can predict the future for the next, you know, twelve minutes. Amazing. Or you say, you know what, I've tried all the things in the behaviorist handbook. They just don't help me with this. It's a very low level of like that's it. It's a, it's a very low level of intelligence. Fine, right? Done. So that's really all I'm arguing for is an empirical approach. And then things like anthropomorphism go away. It's just a matter of have you done the experiment and what did you find? And that's actually one of the things you're saying that uh, if you remove the categorization of things, you can use the tools yeah. of one discipline on everything. You can try. To try and then see. That's the underpinnings of the criticism of anthropomorphization because uh, what is that? That's like psychoanalysis of another human could technically be applied to, to robots, to AI systems to more primitive biological systems and so on, yeah. try. Yeah, we've used everything from basic habituation conditioning all the way through anxiolytics, hallucinogens, all kinds of cognitive modification on the range of things that you wouldn't believe. And by the way, I'm not the first person to come up with this. So there was a guy named Bose well over a hundred years ago who was studying uh, how anesthesia affected uh, animals and animal cells and drawing specific curves around electrical excitability. And he then went and did it with plants and saw some very similar phenomena. And being the genius that he was, he then said, well, how do, I don't know when to stop, but there's no, there's no you know, everybody thinks we, we should have stopped long before plants because people made fun of him for that. And he's like, yeah, but, but the science doesn't tell us where to stop. The tool is working. Let's keep going. And he showed interesting phenomena on materials, metals and, and, and other kinds of materials, right? And so yeah. uh, the interesting thing is that yeah, there is no, there is no, uh, st st you know, generic rule that tells you when, uh, when do you need to stop? We make those up. Those are completely made up. You have to just, uh, you have to do the science and find out. Yeah, you, uh, we'll probably get to it. Uh, you've been doing recent work on looking at computational systems, even trivial ones like algorithms, mm -hmm. like sorting algorithms, mm -hmm. and analyzing the behavioral kind of way, see if there's minds inside those sorting algorithms. And it, of course, let me make a, Podhead statement question here that you can start to do things like uh, trying to do psychedelics with a sorting. <laughs> yeah. And what does that even look like? Yeah. It looks like a ridiculous question. It'll get you fired from most academic departments, but it may be if you take it seriously, you can try mm -hmm. and see if it applies. Yeah. If it has, if a thing can be shown to have some kind of cognitive complexity, some kind of mind, why not? applied to it the same kind of analysis and the same kind of tools like psychedelics 
that you would to a human mind, that's a, a complex human mind. It's at least might be a productive question to ask what, because you've seen like uh, spiders on psychedelics, like more primitive biological organisms on psychedelics. Why not try to see what, what an algorithm does on psychedelics? Well, anyway. well, yeah, because you see, the, th the thing to remember is we don't have a magic sense or really good intuition for what the mapping is between an, uh, the embodiment of something and the degree of intelligence it has. We, th we think we do because we have an N of one example on Earth and we kind of know what to expect from cells, snakes, uh, you know, primates. What? But we really don't. We don't have, and this is, we'll, we'll get into more of the stuff on the platonic space, but I, our intuitions around that stuff is so bad that to really think that we know enough not to try things at this point is, is I think, really short-sighted. 